Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's event. My name is Cecily Nicholson, and I'm joining you live from the Surrey Art Gallery. We are on the traditional and ancestral territories of the Semayama, Kwantlen, and Katsi peoples. Relationships to land and to people that we are accountable to and listen to and learn from every day. I'm absolutely thrilled for all the artists, um, curators, and folks able to join us today. Um, I'm going to sit back. My name is Cecily Nicholson. I should have said that, mentioned that part. I'm the interpretive programmer here. So I'll be behind the scenes with our production team. Um, but I hope you enjoy the conversation today. So without further ado, may I please introduce um, Jordan Strom, the curator of the Surrey Art Gallery. Thanks, Cecily. And uh, thank you to everyone who's joining us from wherever you are situated. Um, please sit back and, and make yourself comfortable. Uh, our event today, Close Up in Conversation, uh, is um, well, very excited to, to be uh, uh, running this today. Um, uh, before getting started on the conversation, I thought I'd uh, uh, begin with some uh, brief introductions of our guests. Uh, uh, I'll start with uh, Jaswant Guzder, who is an artist uh, working primarily in painting, uh, drawing, and mixed media collage. She's also a professor in the McGill Department of Psychiatry, um, and she's currently an Indigenous child and youth, um, uh, uh, working at the Indigenous Child and Youth uh, Psychology Centre on Vancouver Island, and she's joining us today from Victoria, British Columbia, just across the water from the Surrey Art Gallery. Our second guest today is um, Misla Libsikal, an independent curator and cultural producer and art curator. Uh, her most recent or current exhibition is Beyond What We See, Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Future at the Musée des, des Abattoirs in Toulouse, France, which began in late 2020 and has been, uh, is running currently uh, in France. Uh, and uh, Misla is currently based in New Westminster, British Columbia. And we are proud to say that she has uh, deep roots in Surrey and uh, a city that she uh, lived and uh, spent some of her formative years in. And our third guest, uh, Maria Angelica Madero, uh, is a Colombian artist uh, and curator and translator, uh, currently teaching at the London Interdisciplinary School. Her recent work engages with new forms of technology and surveillance. Uh, previous to her move to England, Maria practiced and taught art at in Bogota, and we are grateful that she has stayed up late in London and is joining us for this conversation. And I should mention that over the course of today's event, we're gonna be um, sharing a few links to some of our, our guests' previous work and uh, backgrounds. And so welcome everybody to today's event. So good to see you again. Thank you. And um, so, yeah, it's so good to have you here for this cozy little virtual conversation. Um, you know, it is still a, a year into this. It's still very odd not to be in person with you all, but uh, I think we're going to make this work really well. So um, I think before we get into some of the conversation, I thought I might start with some context about uh, today's today's talk. Um, and that is the, the exhibition itself, which is being presented alongside this, this program and other programs. So I thought um, uh, I'd just mention also to our guests who are tuning in that we will have some time for questions uh, shortly uh, at the end of the conversation. So as you, they come to mind, please uh, send those comments and questions to our Facebook and YouTube channels. Um, and we have gallery staff, Subby and Alana uh, who are managing the chat window. So we look forward to those at the end. Um, so if we could go to the first slide, please. So with fa the Facing Time exhibition is currently at the Surrey Art Gallery's uh, main exhibition halls. And the it features the work of uh, 51 artists, actually closer to 90 plus artists if you take many of the collaborations and some of the, the collaborative works in the show. Uh, most of the work draws from the permanent collection at the Surrey Art Gallery about two thirds of the exhibition and about one third of the works are borrowed and loaned um, from artists and lenders for the exhibition. And like the collection itself, it features work from the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s to the present. Next slide, please. 
So the exhibition begins with um, a work uh, by Laura Wielelak, uh, Tlisa La Jar from 2017. And the vessel is located uh, between two drawings by Surrey-based artist Chito Maravilla. And I wanted to begin the exhibition with um, Wielelak's work, uh, this particular jar, because I thought it, it captured this idea of, of um, the idea of the portrait as a, as a sort of vessel for ideas and for, for uh, concepts that extend beyond the face itself or the portrait. Um, so this idea of the container, but also this, this uh, vessel is, uh, has a uh, image of a sun on the top, which is actually for the Kwakwakiwak word. The title of the work is the Kwakwakiwak word for sun. So it's this kind of orienting device, this idea of the natural world and, and this celestial system as a kind of orientating um, aspect to the show. Next slide, please. So the two dominant strands of the exhibition um, kind of touch on the two dominant strands in many ways of, of portraiture or, or images of the face more generally. So artworks about that are really trying to create a kind of um, image or likeness or semblance of individuals, specific people of, of sort of representations of subjectivity. Um, and that's captured here in this uh, slide of um, Jeanette Sirwa's uh, work uh, where she has put, created an image of her partner uh, life partner, Lorraine. And then the second strand is more uh, connected to the idea of the, the face as a sort of um, idea or form or psychological effect um, or psychic um, uh, essence. And so um, the example of this in part uh, could be uh, captured in Elizabeth McKenzie's baby face project. Next slide, please. So the exhibition is divided into several loosely defined sections. One of the sections uh, contains documentary, portraiture, um, fashion photography, and post-conceptual uh, uh, approaches to portraiture and in photo and printmaking. And next slide. Another section features work of portraiture uh, and facial maps related to new forms of social media and digital biometric surveillance. And next image, please. Another zone in the exhibition examines portraiture and as a form of transformation. So ideas of, of uh, juxtaposition, displacement, um, trans transposition of the images and um, these, these forms of strategies that artists are taking. In the next image, uh, you'll see uh, an installation shot which shows a portion of the exhibition devoted to self-portraiture and not just self-portraiture, but images uh, where the artist uses their own face, their own bodies to, to create the artwork. So the themes of self-examination, identity, collective person and personal experience. And then the last two sections look at ideas of um, historical portraiture, portraiture of community leaders, nations, um, other forms of uh, historical portraiture, and then also images related to mask, mask culture of a variety of sorts. So overall facing time, while far from exhaustive and representative, was assembled to show some of the important work being made in the community and beyond the community immediately here in Metro Vancouver and Surrey uh, and, and show an assortment of strategies used by artists uh, to approach the face and the many ideas that they evoke in our current telepresent moment. And so I guess that I just wanted to transition next to the question section. So if, uh, Everybody is uh, visible on screen. I, I thought I'd begin with this idea of um, the face as not so much a likeness of, of individuals, of, of uh, people in the world, but this idea of, of a kind of psychological capture or a sort of capture of an emotional um, or state of mind. And I, I wondered, what is it that we can learn from these types of approaches to portraiture in both your own works or perhaps works of artists that you admire. Um, so I'll put that out there. I think uh, when, you, when you're asking about this, uh, it, it really is almost like portraiture has moved transitional space where in fact the inner world and the imagination and states of mind uh, are present, that's true. But even if we go back to Van Gogh, and uh, uh, Rembrandt or, uh, and then later on to Egon Schiele or 
Frida Kahlo and all these artists, there were many times when they, the, the portrait was not simply a staging of honor, honoring uh, and idealizing. It was revealing something authentic about that life. And I think that idea as well as the fact that children actually reveal themselves all the time in portraiture, um, or if we think about Art Brut and how suppressed it's been, it's also about what's absent in portraiture. So as much as we look at historical portraiture, even back to the Romans or whatever, we, we can also think about who wasn't represented and what is it that we uh, are preoccupied with in our cultural space as portrait. Yes, Maria. Um, just following up uh, in the discussion, maybe thinking about the importance of portrait um, as self-depiction and as a recognition of the role of the artist when a lot of the times who was represented was someone else. They were like paying for those portraits and suddenly the, you know, the artist gets us this power to represent, but not only that, like, a lot after the importance of that portraiture in the construction of identity and gender, for instance, in the global South, and how that takes into, I don't know, accounts to, to represent that change in paradigm or that change in images and, and how important that starts to be. I think maybe a bit further, we can talk a bit about the selfie and how that changes, like the swap between that representation and empowerment and what Jaswant was saying. And maybe nowadays uh, with the dissolution of, of, of that subject empowered. Thank you for that. And Jaswant, did you want to, I, I know your work uh, delves into this area. I mean, when we were talking about the exhibition um, you've, you've discussed how many of your portraits are not representations of individuals. Did you want to talk about that at this, this point or is? Well, I think, I think that again relates to what Maria is, is talking about, about the internal world and the Im imaginary spaces and how perhaps the, these things uh, really have become more uh, clear to us as a, a kind of a division between technology and portraiture and um, actual painting and the making of uh, a present presentation of the self in an image, uh, for example, as a, an art making, which is why I, uh, I thought about, even if we think about what Picasso said about, uh, it took me four years to paint like Raphael, but it took me a lifetime to paint like a child. That is uh, how can we, we think of this time as also very psychologically oriented in terms of portraiture and as also as a form of resistance and how we can see resistance in spaces through presentation of self and resisting old forms of that are imposed on women and, and other uh, subjects like Bhupan Kakkar's work in India uh, really revealing um, his life as a gay man in situated very innocently in the portrait is, is a context of a whole collective space. So I think we, also see this wonderful opening. Great. I know, Miss Leather, you've talked about your interest in photography uh, quite a bit over the, when you've had a chance to see the show in, in person. Um, yes, um, I would like to speak to a couple of things. One of the things that you uh, mentioned, uh, Jordan, was the idea of the portrait as a vessel for concept. And one of the artists that I'm quite interested in that I've been working with and who's actually featured in the exhibition in France is uh, an artist by the name of Bethlehem McConnell. And one of the things that I find quite interesting and very poetic about the way that she operates is she's also thinking about the histories of representation um, and thinking about the coded bias that operates within the camera and certainly that resonates today in terms of uh, current technologies. So one of the things that you know, I really appreciate from artists um, is that they really help us to think through um, various power dynamics, how we see, how we understand. And um, within the context of her work, I think about who's doing the remembering and also what are the histories behind those technologies. I was just doing a little bit of research, uh, you know, in preparation for this conversation today. And just to give people kind of a very uh, simple and very succinct understanding of how coded bias can operate within visual technologies. If we think about uh, Kodak, Kodak color, 
color film when it was released uh, during the 70s, one of the things about it was that it was actually calibrated to be able to see white skin and not black skin. So if a black individual was actually photographed, you could only see like their eyes or something like their teeth, which automatically calls into, you know, the sort of tradition of the minstrel. Um, and if we could cue uh, image one for, for, for my set, um, we see a piece by uh, Bethlehem. It's this uh, video piece, which is quite short, uh, about three and a half minutes long, titled Use Here. And in this image, I mean, she's calling so many things into being. She's calling into uh, ebon ebonics, uh, you know, this idea of use here, meaning I'm here, but she's also thinking about absence and how the camera is seeing her as she moves through space the camera is actually set up to adjust to white balance. And so it like, she goes out of focus. It struggles to see her. Sometimes she's in a you know, space of white out. Um, and so there's this kind of disorientation. Um, and how she describes this work is she calls it a serious play to question the development of technology and its relationship to the recognition of black and brown bodies. And um, it makes me think in kind of very poetic terms, something that Zora Neale Hurston who was part of the Harlem Renaissance said, in an essay that she wrote, she said, I feel most colored when I'm thrown into against a sharp white background. So all of these things, you know, whether we're talking about something that somebody like Zora Neale Hurston talked about in the 20s, the 30s, still absolutely resonates through somebody like Bethlehem's work. Um, and also, for example, uh, the, the poet and the theorist, uh, Fred Moten, who talks about blackness in the contemporary sense. Um, and this idea of the fugitive uh, of a fugitive image. And for me, what that really means is something about complexity, escaping the monolith, escaping um, stereotype. And also, you know, another philosopher that I'm quite interested in is uh, Edward Glissant, you know, who talks about resisting continental thinking um, and calling into being complexity, which definitely resonates with two of the photographic works that are currently shown inside of the exhibition, uh, Dura al Hasif's work, where she's doing the 46 uh, portraits, uh, self portraits of herself wearing different versions of the hijab, you know, to contest this idea of stereotype within the Western, uh, the Western world around uh, this type of religious garb, what it might be, as well as um, I believe the artist's name was David Neal, who does this uh, uh, diptych uh, of Catherine Adams, where in one image she's wearing um, indigenous ceremonial garb, and in the second image um, she's wearing everyday garb, you know, everyday clothing. She's holding a kitten and she's wearing uh, glasses. And for sure, in that in that in that set of images, what we really understand is kind of the exotic representation of indigenous people. Um, the romanticized idea, which is the same, you know, in the context of uh, black black people and African, uh, you know, people of the African diaspora within Africa as well. Thank you. Um, I know that's a good segue uh, to talk further about um, race and and racialization and certain strategies that different artists are using, but also this larger uh, set of practices around self portraiture or self imaging, and I know. I know uh, the other uh, panelists have some thoughts on on this these subjects. Um, Jaswan, I saw you gesturing. Uh, well, I was thinking as Misla was speaking also about uh, artists like Shirin Nashat, who speaks to uh, the issue of exile in a very unique way and and actually uses the portrait and even the bo the body and the depiction on the body to talk about projections and the internalizations across these divides uh, of, of places of, of her inhabited self in Iran and her inhabited self as an American. And uh, I think it's uh, an extremely moving way of, of actually uh, moving through those, those kind of, of, of uh, of, of very complex uh, social and macro uh, issues. So we're also seeing people moving away from just individualism in the portrait, but rather to the fact that we're collectives. So even when we think about COVID and masks and, and so on, it's, it's really like we have, we've, it's kind of a shock to uh, uh, outside of the collectivist society said, I am because we are. Whereas the emphasis, I think, in the Euro North American context is very much about me 
and my rights and my autonomy. And this is really interesting because it plays into um, all these, uh, these issues that we're talking about, about do I want to portrait myself to be famous and to be in the social space and intrude into it at, or be used by it? And Maria will say more about that in terms of, uh, you know, uh, how that's used. But, but it's, it is also a really important play area between the tensions in, in, in that we see that the artists are picking up and articulating for us, which is, what, which is what the art space should be doing. It is really absorbing the unconscious and the collective, and it's coming through the work symbolically. And we see a certain amount of that in selfie culture through the performativity and theatricality of, of these these opportunities for transforming the self in, in certain aspects of masquerade and, and self-transformation. Maria, I know that you've, you've um, d done quite a bit of work and uh, around uh, artists' use of, of portraiture and self-portraiture. Uh, do you have some thoughts to share on that theme? Yeah, I think it's, it's really nice right now to talk a bit about the selfie and maybe that difference between the selfie and the portrait, the portrait being about subjectivity and understanding it. And then maybe the selfie a bit more going into these ideas of data and like giving your data, well, all of that could lead us to think about surveillance capitalism and like all the, um, I don't know, the amount of information we're putting every day in the world and like the data we're giving uh, in, in our individual spaces. But, but about the selfie, what I think it's really interesting is that there, there, there starts to be patterns, you know, since 2010, I think, when the camera starts to look at yourself, and you start to have that agency of depicting yourself and, you know, all these mimesis and all these uh, transformations in the social world, which in a way is a way of saying, I'm here, um, and it's also a way of repetition. It's also a way of, you know, belonging to to certain community, which doesn't mean that doesn't equate with the idea of having agency, but that that does equate with, with like following certain, you know, trends of of, you know, behavior as well. So I think they're like. I don't know, with Lev, Lev Manovich, you have like the data science understanding of, of those trends uh, uh, and, and, you know, the repetition. But also you have as well, I don't know, people like uh, Boris Groys talking about Narcissus, you know, and the difference between Narcissus, who was someone who was reflecting on the mirror and looking at himself and he was in love with his image because it was in relation to nature and society. And nowadays our narcissus is a bad understanding of that narcissus because it's an individual who's just like, you know, feeding, a, I don't know, towards emptiness, like as, as he describes it. So, so I'll leave that there and we can continue talking. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different different ways to approach that. I, I was thinking about it in relation to how the surrealists and other artists, even you know, post-war but late 20th century artists use the mirror. You talked about the the mirror image through narcissists and and, but also mirrors in their imagery, which you know is something that Bethlehem um, Maconan uh, addresses in terms of trans, but much more in terms of trans uh, transparency and reflection and really quite astounding ways. Um, but this connection to the self-image through like video, this this whole chat, uh, the, the way that we have this kind of mirror image that we're constantly confronted with, what to what extent within these technologies such as this one, is there a certain distortion of one's own self-image or obsession in some ways? And so, yeah, it raises some interesting questions. I mean, just want uh, I just think of your your expertise in, in psychology as well and 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 do you do you fear sometimes in terms of this this mirrored image that we're constantly confronted with with the technology that this having some some serious well, effects? Very interesting during COVID that the the rates for um, young people uh, and in terms of mental health um, the rates that they're using technology of course has has increased massively. So the screen has become the new home of a, a lot of the interaction of young children. And even you can see babies being given the, the phone to, to kind of, the, it's, it's, the, it's become an auxiliary of ourself. Um, but also eating disorders have spiked 
uh, radically. And, uh, it's, and I think there is a relation between this whole agenda that Maria and Misla are bringing up, uh, again, about the presentation by society of what I need to be or might be, uh, what is an idealized self. And, and this really has a tremendous effect on young people who are growing body image, uh, presentation of self. And we see now, uh, certainly since Black Lives Matter, even more in wonderfully critical look at what are you really looking at? How are you being presented? Uh, who is allowed to be presented? Uh, and, and there's a lot more awareness that, well, maybe what I'm being presented is not, uh, it is another false self. It's another collective mythology. It's another symbolization uh, of, of what's around me. And even as Maria says, it can be sold as an image of myself as data and so on. So for young children and for youth, I, I really, I do think we do not know yet what the implications of this actually are. That's maybe a good segue, uh, unless Misla, did you want to add to that? Yeah, well, I wanted to sort of speak to a little bit of, of Bethlehem's practice and how she uses mirrors, because I think it's in uh, image, um, where is it, in image four, it's a piece called Perception Conjugation, where you see the camera and you see quite a few mirrors. And for me, in that piece, you know, she's really, again, talking to this idea of Fred Moten, an ongoing refusal of standards imposed from elsewhere, meaning calling into multiplicity, that I am many things. Like, for example, for myself, my parents are from Eritrea. I was born in Ethiopia. I've lived in Swaziland. I grew up in Canada. I've lived in Surrey. I lived in Japan for 10 years. I speak Japanese. I lived in New York, and now I'm back here. You know, when I go out into the world, I might be received in one way, but really I am all of these things and they are all mine. Nobody can say otherwise. And I think it's also what Jaswant was talking about, this idea of exile. Yes, I live in exile, you know, but I can be in conversation here um, as a woman, as a black person, as well as being on the African continent, because there are so many traditions that keep me in relationship. Um, and then the second one is with Bethlehem's work, uh, number three, which she calls photo sculptures. What I think is quite interesting is one, she brings the, the, the mobile phone into the image, but it's very difficult to see her. But you also see, because there's a mirror surface that you know when it's installed within the physical space of a gallery, you also see yourself inside of this image. Um, and what I think is kind of quite interesting is like the disturbance of what it means to produce your own image and then publish it and send it out via Instagram and whatever else. And these technologies, whether, you know, through social media, whether it was Facebook or Instagram, that first were started off as a point of social engagement and community has now become something else because I don't know if, uh, if you guys feel the same way, but you know, how many minutes turn into hours on something like Instagram? Because you're this, there's this endless scroll, um, this thing of sharing information about yourself suddenly gets, kind of perverse at some moment because you also realize that people are also talking about this idea of um, an edited image or an edited version of themselves that they're projecting out into the world and how that also affects people's mental health, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that um, Bethlehem's work really sort of captures this, this kind of trap or this place that social media is actually also uh, I think taking us to, which is rather worrisome because I think it also connects to this, you know, this space underneath the image now, which is very, very complex in terms of the technological gaze, because what we're also talking about is a coded landscape. We're talking about how this data is going to be used and manifest elsewhere. I mean, we have now a slight suggestion of it where, for example, with Instagram, based on what it is that you're liking or whatever else, your feed is now going to be populated with products that are, you know, a call to purchase. So there is definitely, at least for myself, there's certainly an anxiety with dealing with these types of things because this moment of contact and conversation now is being commodified and, and, and is going to other places as well. That's a good, yeah, Maria, I know, uh, you know, your own work addresses some of these questions and in one of the earlier slides, there's several works in the collection that are in the exhibition that speak to Instagram and Facebook and the social media and the way that algorithms will will um, you know have generate a kind of relationship to other faces and other other 
in personas or other images of, of, of um, people. And so, yeah, this question of um, surveillance and technology and I'd and, uh, love to hear some more uh, building off of what uh, Missa was saying in terms of Bethlehem's work. So connecting with first just want, I think we do live in a transformation of our relationship with the digital dimension, like, and those networks that we're part of have inequalities. So that's the first point I wanna make. Uh, it's not because it's a, like a more democratic space. That means that everyone is you now there's like, coded bias, there's like racism in AI, there's like all this um, really complex, um, you know, that there's like no legislation of technology, there's no regulation. Uh, and, and as we feed the machine with all these images of ourselves, we believe that they know a lot of stuff about ourselves because we're giving them all the data. But I wanna go back to one of the first po points of Jazz Want, and it's that they have no imagination, you know, the data just reads what you're telling it. Like, it has no imagination, it is literal. It just knows about you, what you want to buy. And this is what it's feeding you, it's so literal. Like, you like cars and then it's feeding you cars. It doesn't feed you anything else. So I think the power here, and going back to these beautiful ideas that were outlined at the beginning, is the space of the subjective. It's the space of the weird, it's the space of the, um, you know, it's the space where like the excess of ourselves is not present there. It's not in, only in the image. It's like in the expression and the inexhaustible every day that we live. Um, but sorry, I know I took a little turn to, talking about imagination and I'm not replying to your idea of... Well, if it would be great if you could speak to um, the idea of biometrics, because I think a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of the way that um, there's very complex software and technologies to map the face and almost, you know, as sort of fingerprints for our identities. And we heard about, you know, companies uh, scraping huge amounts of images from the Internet and using them in various ways. Um, could you talk about how biometrics and the, and the sort of technologies of, of facial mapping relate to your own practice? Or, yeah, so can we see image one, please? So, yeah, first of all, there's like loads of technologies that nowadays, well, you know, like biometrics reads our faces and reads almost all of our body now, the way we walk as well as data, <laughs> um, which is really scary. Uh, but, but like, there's like loads of technologies that promise protecting our personal information where you're saying now, that's why the worst bit is that it's not regulated. Uh, those technologies, that's a problem. Um, we don't know how to stop it. Um, but, but in a way it's reading our faces and, and everything as data. So it is actually doing the opposite as it promises. So it's actually controlling and super, and there's like a supervision of that personal and public domain of how we look and how we, you know, that's actually the danger. It's, it's usually, you know, because it's so literal and has no imagination. It's literally reading the, the stuff of how we look. So in the, in the image, what, what you can see, it's a, the work is called Camouflage for Anti-Surveillance and it's a work well, first of all, it deals with camouflage as like the image, not wanting to be an image and like th these ideas of art, you know, and the development of abstraction and the importance for, for technologies like camouflage. Um, but also it's like using those paradoxes of, of, of the space inside technology that we use and at the same time protect, but also making a comment in, in the mask that I hope maybe we'll have time to talk about in a minute and that you know, that, that, that blurring and separation between the outside and the inside, you know, as a protection mechanism, but also like as a mechanism of, of communication. And maybe that is a good time to, to talk about masks in, in general and a mask in the larger, larger sense. Um, but I mean, it's amazing how, how frequently you hear about, uh, you know, the, just the, the expression on masking and masking and, and, you know, there's a, um, a lot of artists, you know, are quite uh, aware and, and very thoughtful in, in their approaches to thinking about the face as a sort of mask, you know, as a, in, in and of itself. And, and we all have sort of masks, even without the sort of uh, mask that we might, you know, that we think of when we first think of masks. So that idea of masking is, it, there's a constant sort of 
play and, and certainly with the technology, it adds another layer. But yeah, if you could, um, anyone who wants to speak to the subject of, of the mask and what this moment maybe has revealed, um, you know, the obscuring of the face, the, the covering uh, through our sort of safety and, and, and health protocols and, and what, what we've lost. But also possibly, because for me, I mean, thinking about this exhibition, it was a chance to think about how there are creative potentials here as well. It's not just a negative um, effect. There's, there's actually through play, through ma mask is, is a very important part of our, our world cultures. And so, yeah, any thoughts on the theme of masks? I think that there's a, such a difference though between talking about masks in the collective space under COVID, which is really about the moral distress of working through that we are a collective and we've and and COVID has un revealed tremendous social uh, uh, sort of positioning about the self and and it's my life and and the whole tension of, of values um, and even brought up also the anti-Islamic I think underpinning of the whole agenda of the face covered um, and what does that mean so the the alienation of the mask is another uh, agenda. And it's so it's kind of like a transformation of something that could be toxic, but actually could be positive. So it's tensions again, it's not, it's nothing is, it, it, everything is being reviewed uh, as it were, but it's not like um, the ritual object of the mask, which is a sacred object and which enters into our imagination because it enters into the sacred space. This is something uh, quite different from that. I, if when we talk about masking, it's not like uh, Cindy Sherman uh, dressing up as uh, all these uh, different people, or or um, um, the, the 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 other but the other potentiality that we're seeing is that we're getting away from the body sometimes when we talk about technology and the face and, and all of these issues. But, but you know, the body is so essential in ritual. And in ritual, when we put the mask on, we are that person. In theater, that is the, the healing in theater, that for centuries, the mask has allowed us to speak as poets and as, as people who convey the unconscious and the, and, the, and the moral dilemmas of life or just life itself. And so the mask is extremely important and uh, ambiguous and mysterious. It's actually just a gateway. I, I would rather hate to put any sort of fixed thing on it, but simply look at COVID has brought out other things. It has brought out our social space and our social anxieties. Thank you. Uh, any, anyone else want to add to that? Those wonderful observations. I have some thoughts. But... I mean, I guess, I guess, yeah, absolutely, totally very um, valid points, uh, Jaswa. I, I didn't want to collapse or, or suggest that masking is, you know, this, the, the medical, uh, medicalization or sort of use of medical masks were, were um, in, in very much proximity to other forms of masking for sure. But within, for example, one of the works in the exhibition is, is looking at sort of the way that masks and entertainment but I've seen there's, you know, just on the streets of the city and in through, through, you know, just watching what's going on in the world, there is a certain, there are some porous borders where people are taking up the mask. It might not be in a kind of formalized or traditional ritual, but in a kind of playful or um, subversive way through this moment, it's, some, it's somehow allowed us to sort of cover uh, it for people who, you know, there's a certain taboo in many ways within Western democratic cultures often is sort of to cover the face. So there's, there's a bit, it's created a sort of moment. And I think, guess I think about it in relation to how artists themselves have um, created forms of masking and through their self image making, whether it's through video or photography or other means. Um, yeah. Um, if I might contribute to this, um, what Jaswant was saying was making me think about uh, the cultural theorist, uh, the British uh, Jamaican culture theorist, uh, Stuart Hall, 
who talks about uh, images not having any fixed meaning, but rather having a wide uh, range of meanings. And that meaning is always interpreted based on historical and cultural context. And you know, for myself, I had lived in Japan for 10 years. So wearing a face mask was actually something that you did either out of courtesy for others because you were sick and therefore you were not gonna make them sick or because you had something like pollen aller allergy. So it was very, very common to see people wearing masks. So um, it wasn't really strange for me here in a certain kind of way to wear a mask, but I think it's just like what Jaswan is saying is that actually the whole thing of wearing a mask has really on some level produced a certain kind of anxiety about can people within a Western society or Western context, can they live for the collective? You know, I think that that is like really such an important question um, to be asking. And one of the other artists that, uh, that I'm working with in, in the context of the show in Toulouse, an uh, artist by the name of Mary Benani has just done a little series um, using uh, an avatar of lizards actually. And what she produces is a sort of like very funny, uh, humorous, uh, cartoon series where she you know she uses these avatars to describe the kind of sensations and the fear that we might go through as we go through public space like for example I remember at the very beginning like if you touched your face with the mask like suddenly you were freaking out because you thought oh my gosh I've made myself sick etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah just um yeah I think um yeah I guess I'll end there Great. Well, we're going to shift to uh, some some questions from the audience in a moment. But I thought, I mean, as we sort of are running down on time, maybe maybe it's a moment just to to if there's anybody who has any thoughts on on the question of time and this sort of because that is the other sort of subject of the exhibition in some ways is this you know this this particular moment that we're in and how it may be shifting our sense of time in very profound ways. I don't. I feel that it does. And I've heard other people sort of uh, talk at length about how it seems to be shifting time. But do you have any sub sort of um, observations, both personal or, or seeing how it might be manifesting itself in the culture at large, this question of time shift? Um, I, I would like to to sort of say that it's, it's certainly uh, told us whether we accept hermetic space and less contact as a, a kind of uh, uh, terrible uh, difficulty or whether it's a gift and whether it can be a gift. And because in many ways it can be uh, a gift. And, and this, this idea of isolation actually led to a huge amount of connection across the world because in, in at least in medical circles, it's allowed us to start to do things like this. Um, somebody from London and someone from here and someone from there and bringing together people and even expanding uh, how we see families in psychotherapy. I, I'm doing all my work on Zoom. I have never done this ever in my entire career. Uh, to, so that, so I, one is sort of making friends with a different kind of space and time. And, and if you brought it, uh, so that's one issue, um, the slowing of time and contact. But, but also there's a kind of appreciation of time. And if you think about the poems of uh, Japan or, or the meditative po poetry, it is about uh, reducing noise and reducing the noise of the world and listening to the pace of nature and listening to other kinds of paces of time. Mothers will tell you this when they live with their babies, that the baby decides the timing of your life and you begin to pace yourself in a different way and you give up, you make that sacrifice uh, because there is meaning in it. And meaning making is part of this shift. Uh, that's why people can shift back and forth in situations of crisis and they're resilient because they know that they're only, in, they're inhabiting something that has meaning. If people don't have meaning in what they do, then we get into a lot of difficulty. And we've seen in America uh, uh, facing a huge crisis actually. In, in that kind of meaning making. But if we look at the portraiture 
um, we see something else that is time, uh, this cosmic time, there's uh, the fact that the unconscious has no sense of time, the fact that all these floating images are also available to us when we paint or make poetry and so on. So I think it's a very, again, it's a kind of signifier of many, many different things. Uh, it's, it's an imaginary space, time. Uh, it, you know, it's a, it, time is the only thing that goes forward. In a way, thank you, thank you, Jasmine. Great. I, I saw Ms. Lud, were you going to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say one other thing as well. It's that if I remember correctly, Jordan, you mentioned that this show was produced only within two months, you know, it's kind of a response to the current context of COVID. But what I also found very interesting about the show was the voices, the diversity, the multiplicity of voices over various like decades and also who's actually being represented in the images, how they're being represented, if they themselves are doing the representing or if somebody else is, you know, taking their image or producing their image. Because in a kind of way, when you say facing time, I was thinking, well, actually, if you go through this exhibition, you are facing time, you know, it is a kind of portrait of the community of Surrey of the lower mainland and further. Um, and also it starts to bring into uh, into manifestation um, communities that have historically been invisible, which for people like us is something really, really important that we are part of the conversation. And so, you know, I, I feel really grateful and thankful that I am in conversation with all of you because it means that the kind of conversation that we're having it for me is a very sophisticated one and I'd like to thank you all. Great. Thanks, Nisla. Maria, I saw you you had a thought as well. Just one uh, second and I'm sorry that the you have members came. of the he family. Said, <laughs> he said disruption of the real, yeah, it happens like every day, but in relation, yeah, that in going back to maybe imagination and and technology, well, how do we use this space and how this time and that this place becomes again, a space to disseminate ideas. You know, now that we're talking about contagion and contagious ideas, how do we use it differently? And yeah, the same with me, so I'm really grateful to be here and thanks so much for the, for, yeah, for allowing me to, to inhabit this space of the visible and the sayable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful to have all of you here. Uh, we have um, a couple questions, uh, and I think we're going to move into that uh, side of things now. We've got a question from uh, Mandeep, um, and she asks, uh, these days digital portraiture is popular. However, to my eye, I still feel that the portrait done by the artist's hand is superior in capturing the personality and character and inner life of the subject. What are your thoughts on this? I know I've, I've, I've uh, heard some remarks along these lines that people do really connect when the work is, it captures the essence or, or you know, that uh, personality or character of an individual that is there's something very special about that. Um, any thoughts on, on Mandeep's question? I mean, I can comment on this on a personal level. I don't know if I, I, you know, the portrait that I used actually for this talk was actually taken by a photographer, an artist by the name of Neil Bodai. And I was really quite startled when he took the photograph because I felt that he captured a side of myself that I maybe don't really externalize so often. Um, there's something kind of maybe restrained and, and something very pensive and not simply happy or smiling. Cause I think there's generally, you know, knee jerk reaction when you see a camera that you want to pose. And I wasn't posed. He actually waited for the moment and it was like a very large format camera. And I mean, I think, you know, artists typically they're very versed in developing a language. They're very versed in, uh, you know, thinking about the mechanics of how something is produced, whether it's like the framing, you know, the lighting, et cetera, et cetera. So somebody who is just like taking a quick snapshot versus somebody who's really, you know, spending hours, days, you know, years refining a craft will certainly produce something else. My other comment was going to be how we've become a film society before, and we've kind of been moving between film and and this other, these other elements. So, and film, if you think of it, includes the body and the movement and all kind of other sensory uh, issues of portraiture. So I think they're just different valences and what speaks to each person. Great, I have a question um, 
of now from Nir Nirmo, uh, my art and portraiture that moves beyond representation, and, uh, or sorry, my art and portraiture moves beyond representation. Someone laughed that it's like art therapy. How much has the line blurred or joined together? Um, any thoughts on that question or this question of, of ther the therapeutic aspects? I know, yeah, you mentioned children and, and portraiture and and that line between art and, and the therapeutic aspects, perhaps. Well, I, and you know, I, I, I also feel, I feel that, that art making is a therapeutic space. I feel it's a healing space, but I also feel that theater is a healing space and poetry is a healing space. So I think there are, there are things which art offers us, which, which are really a conversation with ourselves. Uh, there is no question uh, socially and collectively that art plays a, a part in that, and it has for centuries. And we've rather become rather disconnected from that. If you think about theater as opposed to film uh, or por portraiture by a photograph uh, and a selfie as opposed to making a painting. Um, and it, it certainly in, in, in art therapy and therapeutic modalities, we want to include the whole person to participate. And that means uh, participatory work means you're making with someone and you're making also for yourself to create a reflective space, but it's yours and it's personal. And I'm thinking about how radical somebody like Kent Monklin was to create, recreate the indigenous person, for example. I mean, these are remarkable things. So I think there's a, there, that's healing a collective almost. So, so, you know, I think there's so much uh, flexibility in the answer to this question. Uh, I can't really say that we should put limits on it. Play is healing, and and right. is a place of play. And and our last question here that I have um, is well, it's, it's sort of specific, but I'll sort of make it a little bit more general too. It's a question for Je Just Want. Uh, what is the effect of mask wearing during the COVID um, moment on babies um, who are learning to read faces, but um, most of these faces are are covered. Uh, maybe extending that maybe on children as well. Uh, maybe some others in the, in the group might have a thought on that, uh, the effects on young people. Well, babies, babies are special though, because babies are internalizing you. And I mean, that first four years to, to build up the stability of, of a personhood, I mean, really by eight months, they, they, they know this is my mother, this is what she smells like, this is, and I need her. And, and so it's all, it's all a part of, of that uh, whole in, internal thing. But uh, the, we don't know yet, actually, what does it mean for a baby to see fewer people who are unmasked and uh, to have less social contact? And then again, it's about babies and the age and, and babies are, are definitely seeking, seeking eye contact and seeking, and they are curious and they are outgoing. This is actually limiting that in some way. So we don't know really the answer to that question. It's a very interesting one. Maybe can I have, sorry, does somebody wanted to say something further? I have another question that just come in. So this is from Seth Winder and she asks, what has been the subjective vulnerability of, of the face till now versus the anonymity of ourselves in COVID as we are masking ourselves? Yeah, this idea of, of um, yeah, and the anonymity. I mean, we've talked, we talked about how in some ways there's, well, we, you know, we see this in culture in terms of what people will do when they uh, don't have that, um, you know, there is a, 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 they don't acknowledge their own identity. Like, there's a certain amount of anonymity and, and what people will, the racist uh, uh, outbursts and, you know, the rise of, of, of racism today because people are not able to, you know, they, in some ways they can get away with it without being um, called out on it because they're of that anonymity potentially. I don't know, maybe this is something that Sad Winder is getting at. It was there some thoughts on this idea of, of subjectivity and anonymity with the mask situation? I, I was thinking of all the people that have, have been so ill with COVID 
and have not been able to see their family, have even died without their loved ones. And the only contact some of them had was a nurse with, the, with that mask who was, was saving them. And, and uh, sometimes seen on a video camera to say goodbye to their families. So this, so again, it's, it's this kind of really strange disorienting time that is, uh, it has really pressed us how important it is to have the attunement of the face and how comforting it is to be able to see you and to smell you and to touch you and to be in proximity to you. And I see more and more young people who might even be sitting together at a table and are texting each other rather than conversing and not calling. And I, I, I hope that the body is going to come back into our space in a, in a more fulfilled place after, after this time. It's going to be interesting to see because it's an alienation of a kind, but it's a practical alienation. Yes, Zoom face, as they, they're starting to call it now. Um, Misla, you looked like you had something to add to that, perhaps. Well, I, I can't remember the name of the artist, but it was a sh it was the piece that opened the, f the previous show. And that's also in this show. It's like the cartoon-like heart that's walking uh, down the street. Um, and I, I feel that it speaks also to what Jaswan is saying. For me, how I sort of see this moment of, of isolation and loneliness is also a moment of vulnerability. You know, I think the fact that people are dying by themselves, it makes me very, very sad, actually. It makes me um, think that we as a society need to be a lot more empathetic. Um, and that, that uh, artwork really sort of kind of captured it for me. Yeah. That's Michael Abraham. Uh, yeah, that a couple of works carried over from our fall show because they just seem to really resonate within this 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 uh, framework. But I, that does that work speaks to, and that's a kind of heart shaped armor that forms around a person walking down the street through this city streets. But it's also a kind of mask. But it speaks to that that way that in some ways we emotionally harden ourselves against the the world in these sorts of situations and in some ways the mask becomes a kind of mechanism that reinforces that in some ways perhaps I mean I don't know if that was his intent but uh, the way that that body armor is kind of mask-like at the same time is quite extraordinary and kind of foregrounded. Yeah I mean maybe it's you know the sort of the ambivalence between one as, uh, as armor because I think vulnerability really does give you a certain kind of armor um, but I also thought there was something kind of very humanizing about using your heart to walk through this period that is so challenging, because I think that that would actually make us much calmer and much more able to endure this moment, which we actually have no idea really how long it's going to take before we're able to return to a time where we can hug each other, where we can see each other without being worried, you know? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, that is... That is a wonderful reading of that work as well. Well, I think um, Maria, uh, you've got your hands full. <laughs> I think we're almost at time here. Um, and I think we don't have any other questions coming through. So I think it's a good time to end. So uh, I want to um, begin by just uh, sincerely thanking the staff that made this all come together. Uh, so much work uh, over the last little while has gone into this. And I wanna thank Cecily Nicholson for her event coordination and Alana uh, Edwards and Savi Baines for their uh, event support on many different levels um, to Alison Raja uh, for her supervision for today and, and as gallery director, of course. Uh, and I also wanna thank Moving Image Agency and um, uh, Devin Scott for managing the tech, tech end of things. But a big thanks to our panelists, uh, Misla, uh, Jaswant, and uh, Maria. Um, thank you so much, all three of you, for contributing your, your thoughts and time to this um, these themes today. Very honored to be here, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's been wonderful to meet all of you. Yeah, and I also so want to, nice. yeah and it's getting late in London. <laughs> uh, so, and also I want to just acknowledge also all the viewers who, who spent time, uh, gave up some of their time to, to uh, participate and listen in and, and uh, uh, follow uh, the conversation. And I hope that if you haven't had a chance to see the exhibition, you'll get a chance to engage with it 
through our online um, programming and when it's safe to come by and visit that we do have uh, hours that you'll find on our website as to when you can come and vi safely visit. And um, other than that, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your weekend and take care, be safe. Thank you. Thank you.